Hello and welcome. I'm Rhys Janot and you're watching Know Your Stuff. Today I'm joined by activist, author and journalist Eve Engler to talk about Canadian foreign policy. Eve Engler, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, can you tell us a bit about your background and how you came to activism and then journalism? I came to Montreal from Vancouver to go to uh, Concordia University 20 years ago and I was basically thrust into the uh, um, most politically active campus in the country where you had a student union that was, uh, uh, you know, anti-capitalist, uh, anti-imperialist, uh, anti-racist, uh, anti-sexist, uh, you know, um, student union that uh, was very active and uh, elicited a great amount of backlash from the administration. And, uh, and I sort of gravitated towards this, the student union um, and then in uh, you know, a few years after that, I and then was a vice president of the Concordia Student Union um, uh, for a year. And then uh, around that period, a couple years after that, uh, that was in the midst of the uh, anti-corporate globalization movement, the big uh, uh, summit of the Americas in April of 2001 in uh, Quebec City. So we were mobilizing uh, for that. And, uh, and then I got active in... Um, uh, Haiti solidarity activism after Canada helped overthrow Haiti's elected government in 2004. And that's really where um, I just sort of uh, started really focusing on Canadian foreign policy. I wrote a short little book with Anthony Fenton about Canada's role in Haiti, and then uh, started writing a whole bunch of books about Canadian foreign policy uh, more generally. So, so my you know, the writing and the activism have, have always sort of been intermeshed as kind of a uh, you know, one element of uh, uh, or different elements of a, a broader uh, kind of activism. Um, and uh, so I sort of uh, continued with that uh, up until today and uh, and have uh, written a number of books about Canadian foreign policy. I personally was uh, taken aback by the extent to which Canada was involved in this terrible coup against the elected government in Haiti and responsible for supporting a government that killed thousands of people. I, held, I had the mythology that most Canadians have of Canada being a benevolent force in the world. And so this coup in 2004 was quite a, quite a sort of shock uh, to me and to my politics and to opening up my eyes about just how, how uh, damaging Canadian foreign policy is. Well, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you about Canada and Canadian foreign policy is because uh, as we are here in Germany, I tend to run into a lot of Germans. And uh, they often say they're, I mean, this is the dreamland, Canada, you know, wide open spaces and so on. And uh, the view of Canada being, a, you know, a benevolent actor on the world stage, Canada for peace and so on. Um, I think it's interesting for people to know that Canada is not necessarily sort of the fluffy puppy image that it, that it has, you know. And, um, I was wondering if you could give me a condensed overview of Canadian foreign policy since at least the Vietnam era, so Trudeau, and uh, to give us some historical context here. Well, I mean, I think the most important point of understanding Canadian foreign policy is that Canadian foreign policy has, has been motivated by two main forces. Uh, uh, historically, uh, support for the British Empire, today support for the American Empire, uh, and support for Canadian corporate interests abroad. Support for empire, support for Canadian corporate interests drives the policy overwhelmingly. All the rhetoric about human rights and injustices or equality and stuff like that, that's all very, very much secondary. Um, and in terms of a summary of Canadian foreign policy since the Vietnam War, um, you know, that, that's, that's, that's difficult. I mean, there's a number of wars where Canada has been involved uh, from the standpoint of uh, Iraq and early 90s, uh, uh, from the standpoint of uh, uh, Afghanistan in early 2000s, Can Canadian general led the bombing of Libya in 2011, uh, Can Canadian fighter jets have been involved in Iraq and Syria in, in recent years, Canadian special forces. So Canada has a, you know, substantive uh, militarist, uh, you know, the bombing of former, former, former Yugoslavia in late, late 90s. Uh, substantive militarist uh, uh, foreign policy and engagement in many NATO campaigns. Um, uh, Canada also has a, a major uh, foreign investment, uh, the most extreme examples with regards to the mining sector, 
and particularly in the last 25 years, where Canadian mining companies are dominant players in many countries of the global south, uh, from from uh, you know Mexico to Peru to uh, to Ghana to Tanzania, Canadian mining companies are dominant players. And much of Canadian foreign policy is about advancing the interests of Canadian mining companies. There's many facets to that, Diploma, diplomatic support, investment accords, uh, aid, aid funding that enables the Canadian mining sector. Um, and, uh, and Canadian banks are also major global players. Um, there are a number of areas of, of, uh, of uh, economic life where, where Canadian corporations are major players. And so much of Canadian foreign policy is about advancing um, uh, those interests um, uh, internationally. Well, can you talk about Vietnam specifically? Um, Vietnam specifically, how Canada actually like really sort of enabled the Americans to go in there and start that war. Also, this is during the time of Pierre Trudeau, who had actually had a lot of pressure put on him to stop shipping nickel and so on. Again, minerals to for American bombs. He refused, of course. He kept sending the nickel. If you could talk a bit about um, that, because this is a piece of uh, Canadian history that I think not many people are aware of. Often it's portrayed as Canada having against the war, the U.S.-led war in Vietnam. And there's absolutely, that is a completely incorrect assessment. Uh, Canada, uh, you know, from going back historically, backed French uh, colonialism in Vietnam, uh, backed the U.S. Uh, taking over from French colonialism. Um, concretely, uh, there are many facets to Canada's uh, support for the, the U.S. Uh, war in the 1960s. Um, first of all, huge amounts of Canadian weapons were sold to the Americans um, and being you know, used, to, uh, used in Vietnam, and that was always very clear at the time. Uh, as you mentioned, different Canadian minerals that were used. Uh, there were tens of thousands of Canadians who actually fought in Vietnam, who joined the American military. Um, Canada was part of the International Control Commission, which was supposed to bring uh, peaceful reunification of North and, and, and South Vietnam. And Canada was the Western representative. Uh, in, India was the uh, independent uh, country and Poland was the uh, representing the, uh, the, you know, the uh, communist bloc, or the Eastern bloc. Um, and... Uh, through its role in the ICC, the Canada it helped the U.S. in, in different ways, spied on uh, North Vietnam for, for the Americans. Um, maybe most egregiously, the uh, Canadian officials uh, delivered U.S. bombing threats uh, to North Vietnamese uh, officials. And this came out in the uh, Pentagon Papers, the internal files um, of the U.S. government uh, war in, in Vietnam. And, uh, and it showed how Canadian officials were basically... Uh, would go from Ottawa down to Washington, would be briefed by American uh, 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 officials, and would go to the North Vietnamese, Vietnamese officials and say, if you don't do this, we, meaning the Americans, will, will bomb you. And eventually the Americans, you know, bombed North Vietnam, you know, 100,000 or so um, you know, people were killed in those, in those bombings. Um, and so Canada, you know, enabled, uh, 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 it really participated in, in that process of, of American um, political bombing of, of North Vietnam. Um, and, and if you go look, uh, Pierre Trudeau wasn't as, as, as forthright in his uh, support for the U.S. war in Vietnam, but the, the previous liberal prime minister, uh, Lester Pearson, was an aggressive, aggressive proponent American bombing, uh, American war more generally in, in Vietnam and repeatedly in the House of Commons, you know, referred to what the U.S. was doing as a peacekeeping mission, for instance. Uh, um, so yeah, even at the diplomatic level, in terms of just the rhetoric, you find if you go look at the historical record that Canadian officials um, were quite uh, uh, supportive of, of the war until until fairly late and until, you know, there was a big uh, anti-war movement in this country that were, was criticizing Canada's complicity. And by the, by the latter part of uh, the war and, and the Pierre Trudeau government, um, they tended to back away a bit from their, their open support, but they never stopped the, uh, the huge weapon sales. Uh, they, uh, you know, they, they continued on at the International Control Commission, etc. Didn't they support um, the 
you know, the puppet uh, South Vietnamese uh, president in his referendum to rejoin the two uh, split halves of Vietnam, North and South? Yeah, they, they, they supported the South Vietnamese uh, regime. They claimed it had, it had, uh, it had you know, uh, legitimacy. And then, and then when, uh, you know, refugees left, when American troops left, they opened the doors to Vietnamese refugees. And it was always a portrayal of, of American policy of backing uh, uh, South Vietnam as being, you know, legitimate, as being the will of the people, um, when in fact, you know, history shows very clearly uh, that that wasn't the case, and uh, and uh, the Canadian government um, was shown to be clearly on the on the wrong side. Yeah. So Ho Chi Minh in the north had overwhelming support, and and Canadian officials knew, and there was internal. We know the internal government documents that showed Canadian officials knew that Ho Chi Minh had overwhelming support uh, for a long time, but publicly their rhetoric was aligned with uh, with U.S. rhetoric. So why do you think Canada escapes the kind of scrutiny that the U.S. is subject to? Well, I think that, um, you know, this is a broader uh, question about Canadian foreign policy. It's not just relevant with regards to Vietnam. It's relevant to a, a lot of issues. And, and you know, some things, the, the most famous supposed anti-war speech by a Canadian prime minister is a speech that Lester Pearson uh, gave in 1965 at Temple University, uh, at, at Temple University, which is in Philadelphia. And it's supposedly this anti-war speech because at that time there was a, uh, a battle going on within the American, uh, uh, the Johnson uh, uh, administration over the bombing of North Vietnam. As I mentioned, Canada had already enabled the bombing of North Vietnam. The bombing of North Vietnam was obviously a small part of the overarching American war uh, in Southeast Asia, and particularly in South Vietnam, and 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 uh, and that's where most people were actually uh, killed. Um, and in that speech, Lester Pearson uh, calls for a pause in American bombing of North Vietnam. Um, so he basically aligns with an element of the American uh, administration of causing calling for a pause as a tactical. Uh, position in the midst of a broader, uh, broader war, and so, so Pearson says that within that speech, Pearson is repeatedly states the support for the U.S. war. Like I said, he refers to the U.S. war as a peacekeeping affair. Uh, he states in word for word, "I support the U.S. war in 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 Vietnam." Um, that speech has has uh, been blown up by. Uh, left Canadian nationalists uh, as uh, supposedly this great anti-war speech. And it's literally the most often cited example of Canada, uh, um, uh, a Canadian prime minister supposedly opposing the U.S. war, even though you can read the speech online and it's quite clear that Lester Pearson supported the war. And, and basically, uh, Lyndon Johnson, Pearson then met Lyndon Johnson uh, the day after giving this speech, and uh, and Johnson was supposedly not happy with uh, Lester Pearson, and the the myth makers of of of, uh, of Canadian uh, political life have uh, a claim that Lyndon Johnson actually they've gone to the point of claiming that Lyndon Johnson actually picked up Lester Pearson, the prime minister, by his lapels and actually picked him up into the air. Um, this none of this exists. There, there's no record of this until decades later, until a uh, a, a diplomat. Uh, uh, of uh, Pearson's reporting this decades later. So after the Vietnam War was already clearly viewed as a bad thing and, and public opinion turned on it, they, they, they go backwards and they claim that basically Lester Pearson was you know, campaigning against the U.S. war in Vietnam, even though you can find like literally dozens of examples of him in the House of Commons, in public venues, backing, uh, backing the, uh, the U.S. war. And so I think that um, that speech kind of gives a little, uh, and how that speech has been uh, mythologized over the years, gives you a little bit of a, of a window into how this, this, this works, which is that Canada has generally not been the lead imperial actor in, in, you know, in different conflicts, you know, the war in Vietnam to Korean War before that, or you take uh, Afghanistan in more recent years. Um, because it's not never been the lead actor, it, it hasn't, 
the, the thrust of like you know uh, opposition from from abroad uh, hasn't been the sort of you know prime target. And and but simultaneously, Canada is a very powerful country, right? It it has a, quite an impressive propaganda system. It speaks the two main colonial languages, English and French. Um, so it has kind of unique capacities to pump out its perspective uh, uh, to the world. And much of um, even progressive opinion in Canada, it, it really tries to uh, uh, play up its uh, a distinction from the U.S. When, if you look at, you know, the history of Canadian foreign policy, it's, you know, very close to the line to the U.S. Um, so I, I'm of the opinion that, that it's a kind of unique situation where Canadians have the highest self-appraisal of their country's role in the world of, of, of any country, according to some studies. And, and so um, there is basically uh, this weird mix of Canada having been, you know, deeply tied with the two main uh, empires of the past couple hundred years, um, but sort of somehow being able to escape ever being the prime target of, 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 uh, of criticism. Um, and that's led to a situation where, you know, many people in, you know, in Germany or, or, you know, different parts of the world uh, 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 view Canada in sort of a Canadian foreign policy in a, in a sort of positive light. Um, but the record is, is just overwhelmingly uh, shows that, you know, again, Canada has supported empire, Sporting Canadian corporate interests, that is overwhelmingly what drives uh, Canadian foreign policy. Okay, we're going to take a short break. We'll be back in 30 seconds. This is an act of pure journalism. Every journalist in the world should have been cheering Edward Snowden. He did what every journalist is supposed to be devoted to. Because we have evidence that when we do that, things go wrong. Okay, welcome back. We're speaking with Eve Engler. So, Eve, we were talking just we were just talking about uh, Canada's uh, lack of scrutiny um, on the world stage regarding its foreign policy. Um, what role does the media play in Canada, but not just in Canada, but in, both in Canada and worldwide? Um, and who owns the media in Canada? What are the forces at play there? Yeah, I mean, the Canadian, the dominant media in this country uh, offers almost no space for a criti critical account of Canadian foreign policy. And um, it's a media that's overwhelmingly dominated by, uh, you know, major corporations. Uh, the most important newspaper, the Globe and Mail, has been owned by the richest family in the country, the Thompson family. Uh, the uh, media is incredibly consolidated in Canada, much more so than even in the U.S., uh, the, uh, the post media owns, I think it's up to like 50, 50 daily newspapers across the country at this point, almost most daily newspapers across the country owned by one, uh, company. And, uh, same thing in Quebec, uh, the French media is also highly, highly concentrated. There are, uh, Radio Canada and CBC public, uh, uh, broadcasters, uh, but on a much lesser scale than in in Britain or than in Germany, where I understand that there's you know multiple channels of of, uh, of the public uh, broadcaster, where in uh, Canada it's there there are fewer uh, uh, of those. Um, so and the TV media is also you know owned by uh, uh, the biggest companies, Bell, biggest company uh, you know telephone uh, internet uh, company. Um, so it's a, it's a it's a highly concentrated uh, uh, media environment uh, dominated by by rich con rich uh, uh, people, and that has a huge impact uh, on the the discussion. It's also obviously you know they get most of their money not from the uh, subscribers but from the uh, advertisers, which are generally other massive companies, the the uh, car companies, the uh, uh, the different uh, major uh, dominators in Canada's uh, economy. Um, and so the, the media sphere is, is uh, you know, I, in, in my book, A Propaganda System, I describe um, just how narrow the range of debate that is allowable on foreign policy. On all issues of political life, the media represents power and, uh, and tends to provide the perspective of those who are, you know, the wealthiest and the most powerful. Um, and so, you know, when it comes to the minimum wage, 
they tend to take the you know the business perspective versus the the working classes perspective and tend to claim that increasing the minimum wage is going to lead to you know economic problems and stuff like that. Um, uh, but there is a there is some room for debate. There is a labor movement in this country that you know is able to exert itself uh, uh, politically within the media sphere. But but when it comes to uh, uh, foreign policy, um, there's almost no room for for critical discussion of Canadian foreign policy. It's just uh, presumed that Canada is a force for good. Uh, the 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 dissenting line is is you know comes from a you know a far right kind of perspective like. For instance, the battle for the, the, uh, a seat on the Security Council right now, um, uh, the perspective is that, well, we shouldn't even bother with the UN because the UN is not, you know, represents these uh, uh, African countries and, and uh, it's not, you know, completely in the pocket of Washington and, and uh, Israel. And therefore, you know, we shouldn't we shouldn't uh, uh, even support the UN. So it, the, the, when when a, when a debate is allowed, what's allowed is, you know, the off the off the off the uh, far deep end of the sort of uh, conservative perspective. Um, so, so the media sphere, you know, so much of, of what uh, 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 international solidarity uh, activism is, is actually really just media activism is getting out, uh, you know, a critical perspective and, and you know, writing and speaking and, and uh, that sort of you know, information engagement uh, becomes so important because, uh, in the dominant uh, media, the the perspective is quite uh, quite narrow. That's allowed. You mentioned some of the in industries involved here, the big mining industries and so on. And be interesting to know a little bit more about how they not just only shape Canadian foreign policy, but the impact they have on the countries in which they're involved. <laughs> Well, in the case of the mining sector, I mean, there there are dozens and dozens and dozens of reports and articles, documentaries detailing how Canadian mining companies have uh, spurred abuses um, in uh, pretty much any country in the global south. You can pick an example. You can find an example of a Canadian mining company responsible for ecological uh, damage or human rights uh, abuses. Uh, one of the most, uh, maybe the most egregious example, uh, Barrick Gold, uh, biggest, uh, has been one of the biggest gold companies in the world. Uh, it's North Myra Mine in Tanzania. Uh, there's been, according to official estimates, 65 people killed by uh, uh, security forces paid for by the, by the company over the past uh, decade or so. Um, and uh, all kinds of rapes, all kinds of uh, other abuses. Some claim that number is even, even higher than that. Um, so there's just, you know, endless examples of communities resisting Canadian mining companies and also uh, many, many examples of Canadian diplomats in the, con in the face of clear local opposition to their mining operations, to Canadian mining companies' operations, the Canadian diplomats, you know, directly backing the Canadian mining company, uh, organizing meetings between the president of Tanzania, in the case of Barrick Gold in Tanzania, and the head of the company when there was a conflict between um, uh, the Barrick Gold and the Tanzanian government, and then the Canadian ambassador coming out after the meeting and saying Barrick Gold uh, follows Canadian standards of corporate social responsibility and provides you know direct diplomatic backing for you know, one of the most abusive uh, mining companies in the world. Um, so, so there are, you know, many, many examples in the mining sector, but there's also, you know, history. And, you know, if you take a look at like the banking sector and Canadian banks have dominated the uh, former British uh, colonies in the Caribbean. Now they've been dominant players there for you know a century. And uh, there were conflicts, there were protests uh, in the 1970s against Canadian mining companies or so Canadian banking companies as part of nationalist uh, 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 protest because Canadian banks dominated and they refused to lend or they had very high, uh, made it very difficult to borrow for, for people in, in, in Trinidad. Um, and so they were, Canadian banks were targets of, of nationalist protest. Um, and some of that, you know, continues, right? You see examples of that uh, right, up, right up until today uh, with the banking sector uh, in the Caribbean. Uh, you know, others, other historical examples, you look at um, uh, Brass Can, uh, a Canadian uh, primarily in the uh, electricity and 
and uh, light rail in Brazil in the first half of the 1900s. It was called the Canadian octopus because its tentacles were in so many elements of, of, uh, of Brazilian uh, economy. And it was uh, you know, a target of, of, uh, of uh, local uh, protests and they actually aligned with you know, fascist forces in Brazil. So, so there, you know, Canadian, Canada has been um, a major capitalist player for uh, at least a century. And Canadian companies have been major players, uh, uh, certainly throughout this hemisphere, throughout, throughout, throughout the Americas, but also in, in recent decades, particularly in, in, in Africa, in the different, different uh, in mining particularly, uh, uh, in Africa. And, uh, and, and they've, been, they've acted as, uh, as corporations do, which is to maximize uh, profit uh, no matter the, the con no matter the human rights or labor standards or whatever and and uh, they operate in, in, in you know political environments where there are limited restrictions and they push their abusive tendencies to to the limit and generally the Canadian uh, government backs them up Canada itself has a lot of natural resources and uh, what has it what has all this meant for Canada's position on the environment you know, has Canada been a good actor regarding the climate crisis, for example? Well, first thing I just want to say with regards to the mining sector, a big, a big part of why Canada is the hub of global mining. Uh, so about half of the world's mining companies are based or listed in Canada. Canada is 0.5% of the world's population with about 50% of the world's, 50 plus percent of the world's population, so 100 times uh, its population. Now, part of the reason for that is because the legislation in this country, the stock exchange rules and stuff like that, are very much amenable to the mining companies. The other part of it is that obviously Canada has had a long-standing mining sector uh, within you know, the, its borders. And that's obviously intimately tied to the dispossession of indigenous people and the whole process of, of, of colonization uh, of First Nations uh, uh, internally. And so it became, uh, you know, lots of expertise were developed and, and, and whatnot, and corporations have built up from that, from that process. And so, you know, with the question of, of the environment and, and Canada's uh, record uh, ecologically, as you mentioned early on about, you know, Canada's, you know, vast land and, and uh, you know, lots of forest and, and stuff like that, it can be perceived in a sort of fairly ecological way from, from afar. Um, and obviously there's a certain truth to that. Uh, there's also a, uh, uh, you know, whole history, again, of this dispossession of Indigenous people that that's sort of tied into in this vast land is about, you know, stealing, stealing that land from, from someone else. Um, but then, you know, concretely, Canada is a, you know, huge proponent of extractivism uh, in general. In, you know, in recent years, the issue that's really, really, uh, you know, been the top issue on that is obviously the you know Alberta tar sands and the extraction of the dirtiest form of oil among the dirtiest forms of oil in the whole world and not just extracting some of it but extracting into the millions and millions of barrels of this incredibly dirty oil at a time when it's clear that humanity needs to be keeping all of this uh, uh, oil in the ground and needs to be quickly and radically moving in a direction of a, of a just transition and here you have a situation where you have you know, one of the wealthiest countries in the world uh, that already high, has a very high per capita carbon emissions, uh, saying that it needs to uh, ramp up production of the most, uh, you know, dirtiest form of oil, um, where, you know, whereas if you look at the question of uh, Alberta tar sands from a global justice and ecological standpoint, obviously you're not going to tell Nigerians that they need to keep their oil in the ground before you tell, uh, you know, Canadians from a, from a standpoint of justice, uh, you know, the wealthy country should obviously be first. Secondly, the Canadian oil is even dirtier oil than the oil that exists in Nigeria. So, so for ecological reasons, it should stay in the ground uh, first. And then if you compare the, our, the per capita emissions between, you know, Canada and, you know, different African countries, you find examples where as much as like 100 times per capita emissions of greenhouse gas emissions in Canada than it is in different African countries. So obviously the country that's at the, you know, the, the higher per capita carbon emitter, that's the wealthier country, should be the first one to, to uh, you know, keep that dirty, dirty oil in the ground. So, so Canada's stuff on, on climate, I mean, even, you know, I just didn't, there's a, we're doing a campaign against Canada's seat for the Security Council and Canada's competing against Norway and Ireland. And so I just recently looked at the uh, per capita carbon emissions between Canada 
versus Ireland and Norway. And I was surprised actually that Canada is twice and has twice the per capita carbon emissions of, of uh, Ireland and Norway, which are relatively wealthy countries. Um, and so, you know, Canada is, a, is a, at the forefront of uh, exacerbating and creating this uh, um, uh, climate crisis that we're, that we're facing. So I want to change tact here a little bit, move into the present about uh, the current prime minister, because you have uh, just brought a, a new book, House of Mirrors, Justin Trudeau's Foreign Policy. I was wondering how Trudeau has differed from his predecessors. Well, he's got better rhetoric. Uh, that would be the primary difference. Uh, he talks a bit better game about Canada being back, about the international rules-based order. But I did a previous book called uh, The Ugly Canadian, uh, Stephen Harper's Foreign Policy. Um, and there, there's way more continuation between uh, Harper and, and Justin Trudeau than there is, a, you know, difference in their in their foreign policies. Uh, there are a few areas. I mean, I prefer Trudeau's to Harper's, uh, but it's really around the edges. And uh, and and I mean, you can see it. Like the you know the mining sector is one of those, right? They they the uh, they said they were going to bring in uh, legislation to restrict. The public support for Canadian mining companies found to be engaged in abuses abroad. Uh, after the mining sector did a big lobbying campaign, their their big announcement of an ombudsperson has no teeth. That's exactly what Harper did. It was they brought in an ombuds uh, position that basically has no teeth to to force companies to provide documents or to you know hold the companies accountable. And so Trudeau has basically you know followed that. Um, if you look at you know their NATO policy, right? They they uh, have sent Canadian troops to the border of Russia. Latvia has 540 Canadian troops on the border of uh, of uh, Russia. Uh, Canada's in charge of one of the NATO, uh, the four NATO missions uh, in, in in Eastern Europe, and uh, and it's you know it's continued with this sort of let's demonize Russia, let's let's move towards you know possible war between NATO and and, and Russia, something that the world. I mean, there, there are some real problems in our world. That is. That is the you know very low down on on the order of uh, of uh, what, you know what we need more of. Um, even in the even in the context of the pandemic, Canada has kept its troops in, in Latvia and is and maintained this sort of aggressive uh, uh, posture. Uh, you know Trudeau on climate on climate Trudeau talks a, clearly talks a better game than Harper and is a bit better than Harper. But in 2018, Canada's uh, greenhouse gas emissions increased 15 million tons. Um, so it's the actual, you know, effect in policy is, 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 you know, is very uh, minimal. If you look at Venezuela, um, that's a surprise. I mean, Trudeau has taken a absolutely brazen, brazen position in supporting this effort to overthrow uh, the Nicolas Maduro government uh, in Venezuela. Canada has, you know, instigated the Lima group of, of oppo opponent countries to Venezuela, uh, brought in four rounds of sanctions. And it's just taken this incredibly aggressive position against the Venezuelan government. And that's not to say there aren't legitimate criticisms of the Venezuelan government, but we're, we're claiming that the Venezuelan government is, you know, unconstitutional and is a human rights violator. But part of our Lima group of, of, of countries opposed to the Venezuelan government, we have the Juan Orlando Hernandez, the, the president of Honduras, who has no constitutional legitimacy. He, he's not like the Honduran constitution is clear. There are no second terms. He got the Supreme Court to okay a second term, and then when he's losing the vote, the vote counting goes off, and then, oh, lo and behold, he's, he's in the lead. No cost of legitimacy. In the case of Colombia, another ally as part of our campaign against the, 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 the Venezuelan government, you have uh, uh, Duque, who, you know, the human rights violations in Colombia are far worse than anything taking place in, in, in Venezuela. So, so you, when you look at, you know, who their allies in this campaign are, you know the campaign's not really about human rights or about democracy. It's about something else, which is a government in Venezuela that hasn't followed the orders of Washington, um, that there are Canadian mining companies and, and oil companies they're not happy with. Um, and that's where the, uh, the regime change efforts are, are, are coming from. So you mentioned several times this uh, Canada's bid to get a seat on the UN Security Council, and there is a position, uh, sorry, a petition that, uh, in which you sign. I think Noam Chomsky is also on on a uh, signatory. Um, can you just? I mean, a lot of what you said here might give people a clear indication as to why Canada shouldn't get a seat, but maybe just lay out the argument uh, why Canada should be denied a seat on the Security Council. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, I mean, the open letter lists a whole bunch of issues from Venezuela to the mining sector and how there's all these UN bodies that have criticized Canada for uh, not bringing in restrictions on the abuse of Canadian mining companies to the uh, greenhouse gas, gas question. Um, it also it touches on uh, uh, Palestine and how Canada has voted against dozens of the Trudeau government has voted against dozens and dozens of resolutions supported by almost every country in the world. Uh, upholding Palestinian rights, and Canada has been totally isolated against on those resolutions. Uh, it also talks about different issues, like things like the Basel Ban Amendment. This is about uh, stopping rich countries from dumping their trash in poor countries. The Canadian government not even willing to sign this amendment uh, uh, from you know international labor organization uh, 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 conventions that Canada hasn't uh, signed. And, uh, and the competitors of Canada, Norway and Ireland, um, they have consistently, uh, for these two seats on the Security Council, uh, Ireland and Norway have consistently um, been better actors when it comes to, you know, the Palestinian question, when it comes to uh, uh, nuclear disarmament, particularly uh, Ireland, less so Norway, which is also, which is part of uh, NATO, or the, the nuclear armed uh, club. Um, uh, uh, but has been they've been better on 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 most of these different uh, you know international uh, issues of of uh, conventions and, and and whatnot and so basically what this this petition is about is about getting forward uh, using this opportunity of Canada campaign for the Security Council seat to get in some critical discussion of Canadian foreign policy and we've been successful we've been we released it in the Toronto Star the major biggest uh, circulating paper in the country they they published it which was a uh, a little bit of a surprise, but uh, we were very happy with, um, and we were able to get uh, you know a fair bit of uh, media attention. So we're we're using this opportunity where there's a sort of horse race. Oh, is Canada win the seat? How much is the government doing to win the seat? And is it worth it? That's what the media tends to focus on to bring in some critical discussion. Um, but also, we are hoping that we are going to have some impact on UN member states' votes, and that and that if Canada actually loses the seat, which is what happened in 2010, the Harper government lost their bid for Security Council seat. And that became a big blow to the Harper government. And, and it, you know, Canadians kind of, most, for the most part, foreign policy is not really on the political agenda, uh, but it was sort of forced onto the political agenda and I think opened up some room for some, some critical discussion. So we're hoping that Canada loses the Security Council bid. And then that also offers another opportunity to have a bit more of a, uh, uh, you know, a, a radical, a fundamental critique of Canadian foreign policy where we get forward uh, um, some of these ideas that, you know, the reality is Canada, again, Canada's foreign policy overwhelmingly is oriented by support for empire, support for Canadian corporate interests. Uh, they say lots of good stuff about, you know, supporting girls in Africa or, or human rights or, or democracy. But if you look at it more closely, you find that those are the two forces uh, driving, uh, driving policy. When is the decision supposed to take place? The vote is uh, uh, planned for June 17th, um, so uh, later next month. Pretty quick, pretty soon. Okay, uh, thanks so much for joining us, Eve. Thanks a lot for having me. And thank you for watching. Please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click on the bell if you'd like to receive notification when we release new material. And if you like what you just saw and would like to support us in our work, you can do so by way of donation. All the information on how to donate can be found at activism.org. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.